Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're super glad to be here again. We have been here like two years ago. It was really nice. Um, so we are both uh, from Zurich, actually, so it was not too far for us to come here. Uh, we work at Google, and we are basically focusing on defense and depth technologies, and we kind of try to roll out uh, interesting browser features to protect the user if some, you know, if the primary defense maybe doesn't work so well. Uh, this is Michele. I'm Lucas. Um, and yes, we have a pretty interesting agenda today uh, with a lot of very interesting defense and depth techniques. Uh, I will start with content security policy. Two years ago, we had a talk at Area 41 uh, talking about how to break bad CSP. Uh, this talk will basically build on top of that, so will not uh, restate all the, you know, the bypasses. I would rather like to focus on how to roll out a strict policy that actually provides some security guarantees and what we have kind of learned uh, in the last two, three years at Google trying to roll out CSP. It's quite an interesting journey. Um, and then Michele will talk about a lot of other very interesting defense and depth techniques. Some of them are not even implemented yet, but are in the specking phase, but we still believe they are very promising and wanted to share that. So, a uh, brief question around the room. Who knows what content security policy is? Awesome. Quite some folks. That's very nice. Uh, for those who don't know, I will do like a super quick, really quick uh, uh, intro on one or two slides. But uh, it will be kind of advanced, actually. So, what is content security policy? It's actually a response header that instructs the browser to kind of restrict what uh, can be loaded uh, in the browser. Um, so the most prominent use case is mitigating cross-site scripting. It's still a very, uh, you know, common issue. Um, so that's quite an interesting use case. And, but as I said, it's a defense and depth mechanism. So you always should fix the underlying bugs, right? You should not only rely on our content security policy to uh, be your first line defense. So you have to take care of, you know, input validation and output encoding since it's not a replacement for secure coding practices. And uh, something that we often see nowadays is that CSP is used to prevent data exfiltration. Uh, it's absolutely not suited for that. I'll have a slide. Uh, at the end of the CSP part, explaining this, showing uh, two or three bypasses for that. Um, just wanted to highlight that as well. So CSP is around for many years now, and it's an extremely complex uh, specification, actually, because they kept adding things. They kind of liked how CSP is delivered to the browser because it's a response header and you can plug in new things very easily with new keywords and new directives. So it actually became quite popular for, you know, kind of unrelated uh, techniques as well. And they basically just used the CSP transport mechanism. So that makes it quite hard to understand if someone says they rolled out a CSP, what they actually mean with that, right? Because it could be everything from, you know, blocking frames to mitigating cross-site scripting to trying to prevent data exfiltration. So I kind of collected the, I don't know, big use cases. There's probably other ones as well. Um, as I said, we'll focus on XSS here. Uh, there's also more advanced, uh, you know, injection attacks that a CSP can mitigate, which are basically UI-based. So there was, for example, a keylogger that was a stealing password just written with, uh, with uh, CSS and CSS selectors. And uh, in theory, you can also use uh, CSP to protect against those, but it's already quite an advanced topic. Then just completely different things like, you know, forcing HTTPS by upgrading insecure requests or block all mixed content. And then there is, as already mentioned, you can restrict framing, like framing of childs, but also like extreme options prevent who or more or less define who can frame you under which conditions for, you know, click checking protection mostly. Or if you're serving user content on a sensitive domain, which you never should, right, then you could set the block all policy to prevent that any JavaScript ever gets executed on a 
certain response. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll focus on the first category here. Uh, it's a huge topic actually. Um, and I think it's also the one use case that CSP was originally designed for and where it's uh, actually kind of the strongest. Uh, two or three years ago, we kind of did a study. Uh, we basically took the Google corpus of the internet and tried to get all the CSPs that were set on responses. And it turns out that most of them were whitelist based. I will uh, mention what that means in a second. And with some generic rules, we could basically automatically bypass 94% of all of these. It's uh, pretty bad, right? Because it basically tells you that all these people who spend like years rolling out CSP actually gain very little uh, from that. So we thought it's actually a pity because the security guarantees in theory are quite interesting, um, uh, especially of non-spaced CSPs, but they're almost impossible to use uh, without any other uh, help. So we basically uh, introduced strict dynamic, uh, which I'll explain in a second what it means. And with that, we actually were quite successful in rolling out CSP at Google. Uh, so there's different types of content security policies, uh, if you want, different flavors to protect against uh, cross-site scripting. Uh, Whitelist-based are basically, in 95% of the cases, trivially to bypass. The idea is you have a content security policy here, which gets delivered to the browser. It basically tells the browser, you know, you are allowed, allowed to load scripts from the same domain or yep.com. And in this case, yep.com is allowed by the CSP and it loads. If you have a markup injection and an attacker injects a script tag, like a source script or an inline script, the CSP will compare the source with the whitelist and say it's not allowed, so I'm blocking it. And also the inline script is disallowed because there's no ANSIF inline in the policy. That's the TLDR basic concept of CSP. Unfortunately, this is very broken. Uh, there's a research paper we published about that and people who have been here two years ago also have seen all these bypasses. Uh, basically, if you host Angular or uh, have JSONP endpoints anywhere on your whitelist, uh, your CSP is trivially bypassable. So then there's non-space CSPs which are a uh, quite interesting concept because basically uh, you don't whitelist uh, all the domains which is super fragile and hard because whenever you, you change a path it will break your site. Instead, you in the policy you deliver you set a random nonce for every response and scripts that have the same nonce attribute set will be allowed to execute. Um, this is quite nice because you get rid of all the JSMP bypasses uh, all this kind of stuff, and it reduced the burden of creating a whitelist in the first place. Uh, this is also a reason why it was so easy for us to roll it out at Google. So the, what, this is what the non-space CSP looks like. It just has a nonce here, and these script tags also have the nonce, so they will be allowed to execute. Uh, if an attacker injects a script tag, he will not know the random nonce that is set per response, so the browser will deny execution of these scripts, inline scripts and source scripts. So what's the problem with that? Uh, in theory, this is a quite cool concept. The problem is if you don't control the entire JavaScript ecosystem of your website, you will probably get problems if you load widgets or other third-party JavaScript. For example, if you load a Twitter widget, it will do like create element script and load child scripts, right? Since these child scripts don't have nonces set, they will be blocked from execution and there is probably nothing you can do about it because you don't control the code base of the Twitter widget or the plus one widget or Facebook widget or whatever, right? Or ad libraries, I don't know. So that's actually a problem. Uh, this is why actually no one is using nonce only CSPs nowadays because they're very hard to roll out except if you have like maybe small applications. So this is uh, what strict dynamic is for. It basically the propagates trust to child scripts. The assumption is if you already have script execution as an, you know, even as an attacker, it's game over anyway, right? So uh, child script execution is not really the security boundary here. Um, so if you have a script with a nonce that is blessed by CSP, child scripts will be allowed to execute. This is very nice because suddenly all the widgets and uh, other code paths that do like, you know, module loading in JavaScript just start working out of the box. Um, and there is some details here. 
only script creation through the JavaScript. DOM APIs will be allowed. Uh, anything that includes a parser like document write or inner HTML will not uh, propagate the trust to child scripts because these are very common sources of uh, DOM XSS. Um, one problem is here though, uh, if this S dot, uh, script source is attacker controlled or user controlled, uh, you basically can bypass a strict dynamic CSP, right? Because uh, if this value is not, you know, trusted, uh, you know, it's, it will execute the attacker code in that scenario. So in general, we can basically classify these non-based CSPs into multiple levels with multiple security guarantees and uh, multiple uh, levels of difficulty on how hard they are to deploy. So this is easy to deploy and uh, some security guarantees. Whitelist-based CSPs are basically useless, so I basically didn't mention them. Uh, but non-space CSP with strict dynamic and unsafe evil are quite easy to deploy and they give you quite some interesting security guarantees. So for example, there is no whitelist uh, CSP bypasses. Uh, they basically mitigate all reflected and uh, stored XSS, which is uh, a pretty strong uh, guarantee. They mitigate uh, XSSs that are based on JavaScript URIs. And um, especially if you have templating systems that can put the nonces automatically on script tags because they're kind of context aware. Uh, they're also quite easy to roll out. Uh, and for DOM XSS, many DOM XSS are mitigated, like inner HTML and this kind of stuff. But DOM XSS is where uh, the root cause of the XSS is uh, attacker controlled source are not mitigated. If you want to mitigate that as well, you have to go to here. Uh, one, one step in between is uh, eval free CSPs. Uh, some libraries still use unsafe evil, so if you can, just remove it. Uh, I think it's 2018, so hopefully we don't rely on evil too much anymore. Um, then, of course, if you don't allow unsafe evil, you also get rid of evil-based XSSs. Uh, very interesting categories up here. As I mentioned before, that is like the pure nonce only CSP. They are kind of hard to roll out because you need to control the full JavaScript ecosystem. Um, we basically have most of our Google CSPs are here. Uh, they are quite strong, but for you know accounts of Google.com and other high sensitive domains, we are actually currently trying to get up here since we're in the lucky position of like controlling basically all the JavaScript we load. But it's still a tremendous task to you know implement manual nonce propagation, trickle down the nonces to all child scripts. Um, and also uh, yesterday, I basically. Uh, found out that there is a bug in Firefox that if you dynamically create a script tag and set the right nonce to it and the, link, the URL of the script redirects to another script, Firefox blocks that script execution. So luckily we discovered it internally before we rolled it out to users and break the login, right? But yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll probably file the bug later. Um, so that's the interesting things you find out, right? If you're working on this, just like, Every now and then there's a browser bug and it's like, why is this not working? And it's like, what, the browser? Yeah. So uh, just as an example, this is how a typical policy looks like for every of these levels. Uh, the, if, you, if you look at that, the really nice thing is you set the same policy for the entire application for all applications. So you don't have different whitelists and uh, have to fiddle around. Uh, as long as the nonce is randomly generated per response, it's fine. This makes it very easy to roll out. Um, and then there's also some interesting new features uh, coming up in CSP3. Um, it's basically to ease the rollout because sometimes, uh, so basically when you roll out a non-space CSP, uh, on click or again in general like event handlers are blocked by the browser because this is like inline scripts, so you have to refactor them out. Um, if you again have some other library and you cannot refactor out uh, a script, uh, sorry, an event handler, you can with this new ha uh, keyword hash, hash this JavaScript code and manually allow it by putting the hash of this uh, into policy. Of course, this doesn't scale very well. If you have uh, 50 inline event handlers, different ones, your policy will explode. So it's not really a working solution for this kind of case. You will still have to refactor. And the other thing is you have to be careful because once you hash this part, they can, an attacker could, for example, reuse this snippet 
in other event handlers in markup injections. And if you hash a lot of these things, you might can change some interesting uh, action. You can, might can create some interesting action chains. So use it with care. With care. And uh, there's another one which is, I think, currently only in the proposal state. Uh, this is mostly for for styles. Uh, a style block and a style attribute, they are quite different in the power of, uh, you know, in the expressive power. So a style block can have uh, query selectors and by that you can, for example, write a CSS keylogger if you have a markup injection. Uh, a style attribute is more restricted and cannot uh, do these powerful query selectors. So developers love to use style attributes, right? So in theory, if you want to protect against these UI-based uh, attacks, you could roll out a non-space CSP that nonces all the style tags, the inline style tags, and uh, prevents an attacker from injecting new style blocks. And with putting unsafe, uh, unsafe inline attributes, you could still allow uh, inline styles. Uh, it's a bit of a hack, but it kind of raises the bar uh, to some extent, uh, hoping that the CSS spec never introduces too powerful <laughs> Uh, query selectors into the style attributes of elements. So we're not using this, it was just uh, interesting new features which we wanted to share. Um, and yeah, why don't you CSP for data exfiltration? Because the, basically it's game over once the attacker gains a script uh, execution access. Uh, if you can execute scripts, you can basically do like document write uh, a link tag. In the URL you put whatever data you want to exfiltrate and then, for example, you, you, you click that with JavaScript, right? Uh, CSP does not cover navigation, so these kind of things can be easily used to exfiltrate data. So the, the main goal really is to prevent the script execution in the first place. Once you have that, script execution is game over, right? And there's other ones, like post message, a DNS prefetch, window.open, there's a countless of other DOM APIs, or browser APIs, that allow you to exfiltrate data, right? Um, very quick slide about uh, what we have done the last two years. Uh, basically, we managed to roll out a non-spaced CSP at Google, and currently we are over 50% of the outgoing traffic having a non-spaced CSP set on the responses, uh, which is something I, three years ago I would not have believed that would be possible, because it is like white place based CSPs were so tedious to roll out and so fragile. And the non-spaced ones are actually really much uh, better in that regard. And of course, we tried to focus initially on the, the very uh, most sensitive domains like login, Gmail, docs. And gradually, we tried to move also to non-only CSPs. Uh, but for Google, it's usually just a small improvement since we have very sane uh, JavaScript frameworks that don't do like dynamic script creation based on some DOM snippets, like, you know, I don't know, Bootstrap or jQuery with uh, $HTML and these kind of things. So uh, it's an improvement, but for us, that uh, strict dynamic based ones are also quite good. Except if you use Polymer, then it's, yeah, it's a really bad framework. Um, yes, and we also have a couple of tools for rolling out CSP. Some of them we open sourced, like the CSP uh, evaluator. You can basically paste the policy and will tell you in how many ways the policy is broken. Uh, if you have anything read, it usually means there's very little benefit of having the policy in the first place. Um, there's also a lot of documentation. I think it might be linked from there as well uh, on how to roll out a non-spaced CSP uh, with strict dynamic. Um, I think it's CSP with google.com slash docs. And internally, unfortunately not uh, publicly available, we also have a CSP frontend to make sense of all the incoming uh, CSP violation reports because you would be surprised once you roll out a policy how many violation reports you get, although it's actually kind of working because of antiviruses injecting scripts in every page, malware injecting scripts on, you know, mon like monetizing all, all pages the user goes to, uh, or just browser extensions who use bad uh, browser APIs to uh, also inject scripts into uh, pages, right? So you get a lot of noise and you kind of need to crunch it down, deduplicate it to be able to find actual breakages. And uh, yeah, this is something Michele mostly worked on and it's really nice actually. Uh, and with that, 
I'm handing over to SRI, and uh, you can, if you have questions, uh, we have like 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for that. So, thank you. yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here again. Uh, so that was, uh, the first part is, is around CSP, uh, what we had to do, uh, how we achieved it, and hopefully to give you a better picture of what's the current state and how you can also take advantage of, uh, of CSP and uh, make your web properties more, uh, more secure. Uh, now we're talking about some new and lesser known web mitigation techniques. Some are, uh, let's say, like CSP, a header you can put and uh, on your, on your uh, web properties to uh, add some kind of extra protection, defense in depth. And some others are maybe browser settings that I, I think we think it's uh, uh, good to know and they're not very much discussed. So uh, we hope also to uh, spark your curiosity on uh, uh, these new and cutting edge uh, technologies. Uh, we, some of these are just in the proposal phase, and I will say for each, uh, what is the browser support, if any, um, or if it's just a draft that is being discussed. So the first one, which is very mature actually, is uh, sub-origin integrity, or SRI. So, uh, so sorry, so sub-resource <laughs> integrity. There was a slip because I, I'm going to present something about uh, sub-origins. Uh, sub-resource integrity, or SRI. SRI is basically an attribute you can add to a script tag uh, to basically uh, enforce integrity checks on scripts. Basically, um, often uh, websites have to load third-party scripts, uh, usually from CDNs, for example, to load jQuery, uh, or, well, uh, common JavaScript libraries. So d for performance reasons, for uh, bandwidth reasons, uh, they often load them from an external party. The problem is, if that external party is compromised, uh, this is basically XSS on your site, because an attacker could uh, um, um, host their own malicious JavaScript there, and that would be executed in the context of your web page. Um, so SRI uh, basically ensures that the, uh, that resources hosted on a third party uh, servers have not been tampered with by uh, doing a integrity check with a hash. So basically um, what, you, what you have here is a script tag, um, in this case from a CDN loading jQuery, you add integrity and you add a, a SHA-256 hash of the content of the script. Um, how you generate it? Uh, well, in, for common libraries like jQuery, oftentimes the, you can basically copy paste the script tag which has already the integrity attribute, so there is no work from your side. But sometimes uh, you don't uh, have that ready-made, and so you can go to websites such, such as srihash.org, uh, or you can also do it manually by looking at a specification. Unfortunately, uh, this is uh, a little bit tricky. You would need to use OpenSS, OpenSSL or, well, some tools to do it. This is B64 encoded of the binary representation of the, of the hash. Um, The browser support for SRI is pretty extensive. Basically, all real browsers support it. Uh, Chromium, Firefox, and Safari, and the new versions of Edge. Uh, the only one not to support it is uh, old Internet Explorer and uh, Safari on iOS. Yes. Same site cookies. Uh, same site cookies are um, eff effective way to mitigate uh, cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities. Um, the idea is to add a flag in cookies, which is called same site, that uh, allows servers to mitigate the risk of cross-site request forgery. So cross in, in a typical cross-site request forgery attack, the problem is that the browser is turned against the user uh, by sending authenticated requests to some kind of vulnerable endpoint on a... Um, vulnerable server that has some kind of side effects. So the typical, the typical uh, vector is having an auto-submitting form with post that goes to bank, vulnerablebank.com slash withdraw and uh, just um, perform a withdraw operation. Um, the idea is what if cookies are not sent if the origin, sorry, if the request initiated from another origin, from another uh, site. So the same site flag in a cookie uh, can have two values, strict and lax. Strict says that cookies are not sent when there is cross-site navigation. This means uh, any kind of uh, 
navigation that comes from another site would not send cookies, even if you are logged in in the vulnerable website. This means that, for example, uh, if the website uses same size strict and you receive a link uh, via email or via Facebook or Google+, you click it, you click on it, and you're not authenticated. That's a GET request, and you're not authenticated because the request is cross, uh, the navigation is cross-site. Um, there's also a LUX attribute value, which, me, which says cookies are not sent when there is cross-site navigation, but only if there is an HTTP method that implies side effects, like post and put and delete. So not GET, basically. Uh, this means that the scenario I uh, told before uh, would still have you authenticated, so logged in in the site, but basically all the common scenarios uh, like for XSRF exploitation that usually are post-based or put-based uh, would not work uh, because the request would not be sent with the cookies. Unfortunately, same-site cookie support is uh, for in browsers is a little bit more limited and it's uh, restricted to good browsers. So, <laughs> Chromium and Firefox. Uh, we hope to see uh, more support. This is uh, actually, um, would actually be pretty easy to implement. It would be uh, pretty radical in my way, in my, um, in my understanding, way to uh, get rid of XSRF without relying on tokens uh, or orthogonally with tokens. Um, Let's talk about site isolation, CORB, and from origin. So here we are going uh, a little bit in a more of an uncharted territory. Uh, some of these are in a proposal state, um, and some are uh, being implemented, some are implemented behind the flags, and uh, browser support is also a little bit more uh, scattered. Let's uh, talk more in detail. So site isolation is not uh, uh, something you can put in a header. It's actually a browser setting in Chromium. Um, it ensures that pages from different websites are put into different processes in a strict way. Uh, this um, basically increases uh, security, uh, but um, also adds some checks blocking the processes from receiving sensitive data from other sites. We got, without going too much into details, uh, this has been uh, particularly uh, reprioritized. So strict site isolation as a flag has been around for quite some time, uh, but it's been reprioritized uh, in light of the recent uh, specula uh, specu speculative attacks uh, like Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, while having more strict process boundaries is uh, important. Uh, it's important in Chromium and it's important in uh, other browsers. Um, other browsers uh, have a different approach in like uh, isolating uh, contexts, contexts uh, of navigation. Uh, so they might benefit more from the uh, technologies I'm about to talk. Um, um, but this is the Chromium way. So strict site isolation will be turned on by default in next uh, releases of Chromium, but you can enable it right away uh, by do going in Chrome flags and enabling strict site isolation. Um, it's, um, there are very, very small uh, performances in some cases, but it's very limited, and um, uh, the only way where this can break is probably with plugins or in very weird uh, cases, so it's pretty safe to turn on. It's actually the right thing to do uh, to uh, have a new layer of protection against speculative attacks, speculative execution attacks. Um, what is CORB, or uh, cross-origin uh, request blocking? Uh, used to be resource blocking, now it's uh, request blocking. Um, basically, it's, it's an important part of site isolation that restricts with which cross-origin data uh, is sent to a renderer process, limiting uh, the access to such data um, using speculative attacks like Spectre. So the case here is, for example, an attacker um, has some kind of markup injection capabilities, uh, does not do outright XSS, but uh, so the attacker does not care about exfiltrating the data in a web context, but has some, somehow um, the possibility to exfiltrate it by reading process memory. So we, here we are not in a web context, we are in a memory corruption context, or no, actually in a, in a, in a let's say, binary vulnerability uh, context. So the idea is uh, the attacker has an image tag uh, with some sensitive HTML, 
The attacker doesn't care that it's not possible to exfiltrate it with web technologies because of, well, uh, same origin uh, policy. Uh, but um, the problem is just having it in the same process space, memory space, can be a problem for these speculative execution attacks. So this prevents that. From origin, which is a proposal right now, it's a header that prevents resources from being loaded and including by known white listed origin. So a website can add from origin header and basically uh, list, uh, so give a white list of um, origins where uh, that are allowed to load the resources. So basically, um, from origin has been around for some time and it was thought originally uh, as a, a inline linking. Uh, protection mechanism. So for example, if you have images, you don't want you know, the bandwidth leaching or hot linking, uh, and basically the browser would not fetch it in the first place. Um, but um, now it's been revisited together with the others I discussed before in light of attacks such as Spectre. So let's talk about upcoming mitigations. Uh, Sub-origins are very uh, nice and important uh, mitigation techniques that we would like to see more traction. Um, this is still in a stage of a proposal. Uh, Sub-origins' uh, whole idea is uh, to make web origins more fine-grained. So web origins are, um, uh, are tuples. So web origins are, are the security boundary of, of the web. Um, they are a tuple uh, right now defined as scheme, host, and port. The idea is with sub-origins, you would add a fourth field called namespace, which is um, defined in a sub-origin header. So the idea is you send uh, a sub-origin header with, I don't know, like admin area or sensitive or um, marketing pages, and you would be able to further isolate your pages as if they were in a separate origin. So an XSS there would not be able to um, uh, exfiltrate content from the main origin. Uh, so the idea is why are sub-origins needed? The idea is in some cases it's hard to uh, isolate um, parts of a website that are more sensitive or they have poorer coding practices uh, by using subdomains or completely separate domains. Um, for example, let's think of WordPress that has the slash WP admin, uh, which is almost always on the same domain. Uh, it would Basically, uh, using, I don't know, WP admin sub-origin that would make it basically uh, segregated, which is a great thing. Let's also think about sensitive functionalities like password reset or marketing pages uh, that sometimes have subpar uh, code quality standards, but maybe for legacy reasons are on the main domain of a, of a company. So adopting sub-origins might require, often requires actually some refactoring. Um, because uh, the, the origin concept is, is made more, more, more fine-grained. So basically, communication depends on uh, from what to what. Sub-origin to sub-origin sub is fine as long as both of the resources send the same sub-origin header, because they are considered same origin. Um, sub-origin to the parent origin um, requires the addition of access control allow sub-origin, which is very similar to access control allow origin, of course, cross-origin request, request sharing, um, um, resource sharing, sorry. Um, uh, but it is tailored for sub-origins. And finally, sub-origins to an external origin re require, um, as currently, uh, the use of access control allow origin header. So here I have a small demo to show um, a uh, Chrome extension that we developed internally. Um, unfortunately, it's not out yet. Uh, if sub-origins uh, get more traction, we'll think of uh, open source it. Uh, the uh, extension uh, was created by our intern, Elena Ionescu, and allows to um, prototype what kind of um, sub-origins on your website to see what's the current state and what actions might be needed and what refactoring might be needed. So let's have um, Google Finance so Google Finance, for historical reasons, is still mapped on www.google.com, which is the main, um, uh, well, one of the most sensitive um, uh, origins on google.com. Um, so we have this extension, sub-originator. Um, we define the target site and we start it. Once it started, we
Okay, now it's redirects immediately on to slash search, which changed from last time I did this demo. Okay. So, so this will be a little bit more noisy, but let's just have it work for all tab 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 to the com. Uh, I'm not sure it works. But anyway, let's uh, just browse around a little bit, trying to stay on the same origin. So we're looking at our stocks. Uh, I can't click here because I will navigate away. Uh, I think this might be good enough. Let's display the report. Okay. Okay. This is different from the last time because probably when I put slash uh, www.google.com, this was larger. Uh, but the idea is, uh, here, the extension populates a report with all these um, communications that uh, it has uh, found uh, by using um, Chrome debugging APIs. And in this case, uh, you, you can see that um, a, the page here um, had requested resources from uh, slash async and slash search. So basically, these would have to send the same sub-origin header because they would need to be on the same sub-origins. And also, there are some sub-origins to external. Um, that uh, require a course header, basically, allow access control allow origin. Um, so um, uh, you have to think of this report in a little bit of a different way um, uh, that it is displayed. Actually, this slash search is very likely a sub-origin to parent origin, uh, unless we want to put also slash search in another sub-origin. Uh, and so in that case, it would be, be a sub-origin to origin. Uh, but let's talk about... Um, you can show it with about, maybe? Like yes, exactly, exactly. Another, another example, which are some static pages that we have on www.google.com slash about. So on this... Okay. Yes. Um, so here there are some marketing pages and uh, a blog. Uh, that is also hosted on dub 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 on slash about. So we um, uh, perform a few actions, like we uh, we open videos. We we just click around. We open a new one, it's still on slash about, as you can see. There is audio of a monkey. OK, so here we do display report. Yes. And we see that there, is, there are some sub-origin to sub-origin uh, requests, which means on the slash about. So basically, this means that as long as the resources on slash about send the sub-origin whatever about, maybe, uh, this will work out of the box. But there are also some sub-origins to external. Uh, basically, these require course headers. So usually, subordinates to external do not require refactoring because they already require a course header set on the, uh, respo on the, on the response. Uh, this means that for in this case, um, in this case, um, no refactor is probably needed. Um, basically, subordinates to origin is usually the case that requires refactoring. Okay, let's continue. Let's stop this and continue. Okay, origin policy uh, is uh, another mechanism to actually apply um, a lot of defense in-depth mechanisms, such as uh, content security policy, referrer policies, and others, to pin it to an entire origin. So the idea is to uh, maximize coverage by saying, we want these policies to be applied to all the origins, even if we don't explicitly, if we miss something, if we don't explicitly put it in the header of the uh, resources. Uh, this complements header-based delivery and actually increases coverage. So sometimes it happens that, for example, error pages or debug handlers are actually sent by a different part of the technology stack, and so we might, uh, we might miss some, some resources. This makes, makes sure that this does not happen. And this is still a proposal. Uh, feature policy is also a proposal. Uh, it allows to uh, selectively enable and disable some uh, web APIs. Uh, so basically, you as a webmaster um, 
especially in combination with origin policy. I, I feel that feature policies make sense the most in combination with origin policy. So when pinned to an origin, you can uh, decide, you can say, you can have a manifest that says, uh, I need geolocation API only on slash locate, for example, and not anywhere else. So um, together with origin policy, you can restrict, uh, you can reduce the attack surface of uh, XSS on the domain by just saying, uh, we just need these web APIs on these uh, uh, endpoints, for example. I think we're also slightly earlier, which is great because we can have more questions and we really like to receive questions. So any question you might have. Thank you very much. Awesome. Hey, thank you very much, guys. That was a really cool, interesting talk. Loving to see the cutting edge stuff. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone have any questions at all for these guys? I know it's early morning, but I'm hoping the brains are working already. Anyone have anything? Oh, yes. Come on. Thanks for the talk, guys. Um, how realistic is it that some of these proposals actually end up being adopted across uh, modern browsers? Or is this something that most of the other browser manufacturers are not interested in implementing? Well, I guess uh, Chrome is usually quite fast in picking them up. Firefox kind of also. And for Safari and Edge, I guess it depends if you know how much interest is shown in it. Uh, historically, sometimes it took them quite a while uh, to pick up these things, but especially in the light of uh, Spectre and this kind of uh, the, the, all the other uh, speculative execution attacks, it maybe at least uh, you know the mitigations in that realm probably get more traction uh, because I guess browser vendors also want to show that they you know care about security and that they also care about the current security threats, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. So I would say that uh, like it really depends on which one you're talking about. So if you're talking, for example, about the security execution one, there is a lot of interest. Uh, I'm talking about Corb mostly and from Origin, uh, from other browsers, like uh, non-Chromium browsers, because uh, it's uh, basically very important for them since they chose to uh, not pursue strict uh, um, process isolation by site. So it's actually uh, very, uh, th they're actually really wanted. Uh, while for others, like for example, sub-origins uh, actually are very complex, are very complex proposal, yeah. require to touch a very delicate uh, component uh, yes. of uh, web security, which is the concept of origin. So there have been some um, alternative uh, proposals. Uh, so for example, uh, some people think that it would be better to actually uh, augment a sandbox attribute in HTML5, well, in HTML, uh, instead of having a, a header-based delivery. Yeah. And I, I think, for example, Firefox containers, they work on like a somewhat very similar technology than Sub-Origin, but more or less uh, restricted to the user side, right? It's like not the web administrator who sets the, you know, fine-grained origin, it's more the user that can put uh, different sites into different uh, buckets. Yeah, I mean, also having some kind of uniform uh, testing framework for all browsers would be great. Uh, you know, we're trying really hard to have it. Uh, this is because implementation of this uh, mitigation sometimes differs between browsers. And, uh, you know, for example, how origins are implemented across browsers differs. So maybe for some browsers, it's very easy to implement one of these mitigation techniques. For another browser, it might be very hard and require extensive uh, uh, refactoring. So it, it, it happened, actually, in the past. So uh, this might also be something to think about. Cool. Any other questions? Beautiful. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that 94% of the people that implemented CSP uh, did it wrong, or it can be bypassed. Do you have any ideas how to fix that, or at least improve yes. that number? Yes. Um, so as I said, there was basically a talk two years ago at Area 41. Uh, the TLDR is usually you should not use policies based on CSP whitelists because the design is so fragile and you will basically almost always end up with uh, whitelist entries that either have like a JSMP endpoints, uh, hosting uh, Angular or other JavaScript frameworks that kind of allow like uh, symbolic execution of code on top of JavaScript, right? So the recommendation really is move away from this type of policy 
and instead try to use a nonce-based policy, uh, either with strict dynamic or if you can, uh, nonce only. If you use strict dynamic, you also have to be careful which kind of JavaScript framework you choose because uh, some of them uh, introduce bypasses themselves. But the recommendation is basically not use widely spaced policies. But that was, like, you know, almost everyone uses widely spaced policies because this is apparently how everyone understood CSP and what they did. And, yeah. It would be interesting to do a study again and see if the percentage changed. Um, also, in regards of CSP, um, can you share your thoughts on the script gadget uh, research that your colleagues also, also did? Yes, uh, so there is a, a very uh, cool GitHub page for, by created or mentored by Sebastian Leckis and uh, Kotovic. Um, so they basically collect all the bypasses there for all the frameworks and libraries defined, and they also keep it updated. Uh, it's, I think it's, it, it can be a problem uh, for developers if they use one of these frameworks, right? Uh, luckily at Google, we basically are sticking to a couple of core frameworks, so it's less of a problem for us. Uh, I think we had an XSS on a, a page with strict dynamic that was using Polymer, but this is, for us, it's kind of a known issue because Polymer is really, you know, the, the, the boundaries between the DOM and JavaScript, they're so interleaved that CSP as a technology really cannot do much there, right? Um, same for Angular, but starting from Angular 2, they actually kind of fixed it themselves by having ahead of time, or like basically compiling all the templates uh, uh, ahead of time. And um, yes, so if you use any of like uh, these like fancy frameworks, I would also recommend to, to check uh, that page and see if it's there. And if it's there, you might have either to patch some of these frameworks, for example, at Google, we use a check internal version of jQuery that basically patches uh, the dollar HTML call to be compatible with CSP and not introduce these kind of gadgets. Basically, what you have to care for is if you use CSP with nonsense and strict dynamic that whenever like the framework creates scripts for you, because of templates or whatever, you need to kind of make sure that the, the source or inner HTML of, or inner text of a script tag is actually already has a nonce, right? Or you just disable it. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add that's, oh, that's very cool research and um, uh, especially for the web. I think there's also a, a talk uh, by the authors in uh, Black Hat uh, this year. In case you're, you're interested, they will present also more yeah. research. Cool. Last chance, any more questions? Oh, last minute straddlers. Yeah, there are so many issues with uh, cross-domain calls and all that. Uh, as a user, I would have liked to have a, a setting in the browser um, that completely disables all cross-domain calls. Would that also be uh, an option? I, I guess it would break every site, but it would be an option, I guess. <laughs> Um, there are extensions that do that, I think, right? So there's Chrome or Firefox extensions that basically let you specify if you want to allow any cross-domain calls. Um, well, uh, having a default source non-policy is yeah. uh, not exactly what you asked for, but it's very similar. But also disables JavaScript. Default source self, right? Uh, oh, uh, oh, you just said cross-site. Cross, oh, okay, yeah, cross okay. Origin. But I mean, that would... okay, yeah. Depends what, what kind of requests you're talking about. But uh, yeah, this would definitely break because that's not how the web works, unfortunately, right? So I think also the, the CSP whitelist uh, approach uh, didn't work because it was a little bit detached from how the web really worked, which is uh, like a lot of cross-site uh, communication. Um, and, and you it have changes to whitelist, over time, right? And it changes over time. So you had this like, you know, fluid whitelist that you have to maintain. It was like a burden. Uh, so what, what we're seeing is actually the opposite. It's like the web is, is very much interconnected and a lot of requests are made. Uh, and actually, uh, they're dependent also on, on some, you know, origins like CDNs, yeah. for example, that are actually introduced a single point of failure. And uh, so that, that, that's a huge problem. Cool. If we don't have any more questions, I think we're done then. Thank you very much, gentlemen, once Thank again. You. Appreciate Thank you. Just a round of applause for you.